Well, I have put my watch on the table. I'm going to finish on time. Thank you so much. Dear Erol Bilecik, I'm going to take it from where Erol Bilecik left, the 100th anniversary of our republic. I would like to uh, wish everyone uh, blessings, peace, and well-being, and may our republic prosper. So, dear friends, since the very morning, I have been hearing uh, these uh, presentations and these speeches, and it set me thinking some new things about my topic. I have added a number of sentences, and at the beginning of my speech, I would like to share those with you. And this is what I understood. Our Republic of Turkey has been established on ethical values. I would like to reiterate that. Republic of Turkey has been founded on ethical principles. It's a contemporary state. The second thing is, the second takeaway take from all these inspiring speeches is Mustafa Kemal Atatürk embarked on a journey to elevate the reputation of the Turkish nation. So his leadership during the war times or in the aftermath of the war time in the construction period of the Republic, which is a total of 18 years, uh, 1919 and 1938, three of which were spent in the war, active war, hot war, and then the remaining period was spent on the um, construction of the country. This leadership was mainly done so that the Turkish nation will be at the same level, at par with the other nations, and to capture the, 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 the contemporary civilization. So this is the journey that he embarked upon with his nation. The journey is called the reputation journey of us, of ours. That is why we are sometimes becoming rather pessimistic or despair, falling in despair or some of you are sharing so much and questioning well, what's happening to our uh, republic. This is very much uh, related with the ethical values of the republic. So in the presence of this elite audience, I would like to once again remind you that it requires a certain wisdom to see beyond the mountains, to be able to focus on our business and our success. Uh, it requires, this requires patience, patience is required. And also, as we heard from the previous sessions, that so there are plethora of risks, and in order to manage those risks, uh, we need courage. And I'm not going to be repeating that. We already know that. And I think that is where we would like to go. Uh, so over here, I'm here to remind you that our great leader, Erol Bey, used the term the leader of the century. So our great leader, particularly from the perspective of leadership, has brought a number of lessons, and this is what I would like to focus on. And I'm going to do this underneath three headings. The first one is in our leader, in our leader, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, he had the feature of setting up an organization and leading, managing an organization. So as of 1919, politically speaking, in a military sense, during the establishment, during the foundation, during the construction, and in the social sense, he always set up organizations, and he was meticulously interested in managing, or he was personally managing them. Well, of course, uh, so that includes the, or the, the, the military, the army, because he was the chief of uh, commander, and he was there to, to major field uh, wars. He was there to lead it. And when, I, when, we, when we address uh, that notion from the perspective of leadership, it is full of lessons. Lessons in terms of ethics as well. Let me share a very striking 
one with you. His classmate from the School of Military, uh, he, he loved the, the friends so much. Uh, he was going over to their house to eat his mother's food, uh, or, and he had to depost him. And he, he deposted him as well. And instead, he posted someone who believed could do that job better. And he, of course, did not spare that friend from the leadership uh, perspective. He made use of that person because he had great fluency in French. He posted him as an ambassador to Russia. And in the later stages, they continued together. And to, to found an organization and to manage to lead. So when he embarked on a journey, I'm using his own terms. Well, because he says that I had to go outside the city walls of Istanbul for the period of six months. He said it was a mistake to come to Istanbul from Adana, uh, 30th, of, 30th of October after the ceasefire of Montrose, uh, Montreux, uh, and uh, because they felt that he could not, uh, they could not control him, so he was called immediately. He came to Istanbul. He spent six months, and somehow it was he was thinking of going to Anatolia. And after he passed to Anatolia, dear friends, so let's call it this way. Well, he stepped out. Well, he took Bandırma ferry to uh, Samsun, and then he landed on 27th of December until 1919. 225 days passed. If you ask me. I think 1919 is the longest year of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk's life. He created an unbelievable network, thanks to telegrams. I would like to now give you some numbers. In Havsa, he spent 19 days. He sent 59 telegrams. So it's not like sending a tweet, writing a tweet. So you have to create something out of the Morse alphabet. You have to write the text. Someone has to transcribe that into that system of symbols. And the recipient has to be there to receive that. They're going to do the same deciphering. It takes a lot of time. Sometimes he, he spends all night in that telegram house. Likewise in Sivas and in Erzurum. So my point is, in order to create those organizations, what are those? First of all, political mudafai hukuk, the preservation, the, the defense of uh, law, Erzurum Congress, Sivas Congress. So underneath and underlying all those, we have the legitimacy. There is this notion of legitimacy. He's not on his own. He acts with a, with a team. So please pay attention to that. And one of his biggest important features is collecting human beings wherever he worked. So uh, on the front line, he was there, questioned with his own comrades, and he stuck with those people. This is what we said. Uh, so when he was working as a mujahid at Libya, a savior, he, uh, there was a colonel who was wounded with four bullets. And then uh, he was uh, there supporting him afterwards, or his comrades at Çanakkale. These are the people coming from the, uh, the, the, the battlefield and the barracks, actually. And uh, this is very important. You can imagine how important it is. So when that's the case, um, and when he embarked on a journey, the second thing, uh, I think, the second feature of his leadership, the most important leadership aspect is he's not a quitter. He never gives up. He never gives up on the target. Whatever he's going to do, well, he's doing them. However, so it is never quitting is not the same thing as a foolish insistence. Just like at Sakari, if he has to uh, withdraw, he goes to the headquarters of Ismet Pasha, you know, after the defeats of Eskisher and Kütahya, he is going to take all these troops back to the northern section of Sakarya. And he does so. And you know, the rest is history. 22 days, 22 nights, 
he fought the Greek army. A, a cutthroat battle, and it is indeed a uh, cutthroat. And then uh, the Greek army had to retreat to Afyon, the western part of Sakarya. So my point is, he, he was always locked on to his destination, his, his ultimate target. What is that? Errol Bey expressed that sustainability. Another colleague talked about risk management. So you, distinguished members of the ethical society, the managers, the members of the ethical society, as people who are believers of that, uh, you are in a fight of ethical values. So our founding father, he says that, well, you should not give up, never give up. What he never gave up? In 1921, after Sakarya battle, uh, when he was signing Ankara uh, agreement with the French people, Hatay was not within the borders of Turkey. Back under those, Anton uh, Antep Urfa uh, was sort of the sufficient target. That's where they stopped. But when did he take back Hatay? So he never forget about that. In 1938, he was sick in bed. He was even about to die. In the last prime, the, 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 the ministerial cabinet meeting underneath his presidency, he was in a chaise long because you know he was covered with blankets because he couldn't sit up straight. It was his ultimate cabinet meeting. It was about Hatay because he never gave up. And in a reception uh, to the French ambassador, he told that Hata is my personal topic because previously they had to retreat or at Sakarya, you know, like, you know, they had to step back. Or let me quote another example. We could, of course, always increase the number of such examples. But the third important thing is, uh, so here, I think it very much has to do with the ethical perspective. And I don't say you, because I'm one of you as well. It's a very relevant leadership feature, which is relevant for all of us. Accountability. So all throughout the life of Atatürk, in, particularly in his political or his military or social life of Mr. Kemal Atatürk, he was always accountable. So that's that's what I have read and what I observed. Accountability to what? We had Erzurum Congress, Sivas Congress. You know, you could read his addresses. Accountability to the cabinet. But this is not sufficient. And one day comes and he says that we are accountable in front of the history. We, are, we have to be held liable. We have to account for that. So dear friends, Nutuk. Uh, it's a book, his preach, his, his book of um, his book of speeches, is his addresses, his orations, is actually a, a history of whole accountability, and he is documenting everything with documents. And of course, uh, we have to read what the others, the testimonials of the other commanders or the other military documents as well. However. It is completely from one edge to another. It's a complete book of accountability. And I think he, accountability in front of the history, it sets me really thinking. So regarding this accountability, there is also, well, I'm sure it won't take you by surprise. Self-accountability is another important notion. So. Let me explain it as such. Well, he left Samsung, car, vehicle, was maximum going at a speed of 25 kilometers. So first of all, they had a stop at Kavak, and then they reached Havza. By the way, the names, I'm naming these names of locations I, on purpose, because maybe some of you are from those places. And before arriving at Havza, it was there where he decided to go to Havza. And the government posted him as the uh, army inspector, asked him to come back. 
because the British uh, commander in chief was, you know, he was not very happy, pleased with the fact that he was there, and he refused to go. And uh, because in order to avoid the disobedience, this is what he said: Well, there are no ferries, no ships, no fuel. So, and uh, they proposed something to him, and he he moved to Hausa because of health, uh, because there are some hotbeds over there. So see, he doesn't want to be uh, on the negative side of things with the government. I'm going to be rather fast over here. So maybe he took the decision in Istanbul, we never know. Maybe. Uh, the government calling him back pushed him to do this. We don't know, but. I also discussed this with professional army officers, and I asked them, what Mustafa Kemal did? Is it the <laughs> Minister of Defense is calling you, and you are not going back to Istanbul? You know, can you do that? Well, this is disobedience, they told me. But then it set me thinking more. So regarding when I was writing the ethical legacy of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. Because in our national defense history, it's a huge debate. And you know what? I really figured that out. That moment, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, well, of course, he failed to perform his duty to the government. But he, he heard or listened to the sound of his own conscience. And at Nutuk, his uh, magnum opus, he's really talking about that a lot. I was trying to listen to my own sound of conscience. conscience. And as I indicated at the very beginning of my speech, he was trying to elevate the reputation of a whole nation, of the whole country. And then, well, I can't go into obviously the details because of time limitations. And I would like to. Uh, I would like to not finish uh, soon. Uh, I'm very careful so that uh, I'm not forced to be on time, but you know, the program is supposed to finish at one o'clock. And in the upcoming days, another the government posts uh, assigns another inspector, which means that he was sort of deposted. And then on his route, the governors were a mess uh, because. Are they going to greet the incoming person or not? Well, if it's an army inspector, they need to do that. So see how things ended up. And uh, he asked the Minister of Interior Affairs, what's going to happen? What are we going to do? So this is the Ministry of in in Interior Affairs. And Mustafa Kemal Pasha is, has been released, has been sent away, because we have the document has been sent away. But then there is nothing to do. And at some places, he was not greeted officially. And there sometimes, some places, he was going through in total silence. And uh, we there, at some places, there were officers to uh, put him into prison, to, to put him into sentence. And then through Erzincan, he was going to Erzurum, uh, Ulija, and he wanted to go to Erzurum in no time when he go to Erzurum, well, Erzurum um, people uh, greeted him at Ulucca, Kazım Karabekir Pasha. Well, you know, they, they embraced each other. Well, uh, it, in the meantime, he asked some of his, no, some of his friends told him that you, you need to resign. And the government was not in hesitation. The government, with the will of the uh, emperor, uh, the sultan, he was exported. He was released from the army, and they took away not only that. He took his seniority, the medals, everything. He was deprived of everything. And the next stop, it was only Mustafa Kemal. So Ferdi Millet, it's one individual of the society, of the nation. And... This Mustafa Kemal did not, did not have an army. So there was an army 
uh, of Kazım Karabekir. Uh, but you know, the army corps are not the army corps that you know that we are familiar with today. They're melted. They're diluted. They diluted from the First World War. Let me share the findings of one research. Those who went to army to, from the rural section, those who were able to come back, it's one out of 13, the youth who did not lose their life. So uh, the remaining, no, they, they lost their lives. So we're talking about such a structuring. And then Ali Fuad Pasha in Ankara, in Konya, there was an army corps, there was an army corps. So there was this sort of civil organization. They had to bring together people and they had to, someone had to lead them. But over there, the decision he took is a decision when you take between norm and ethics. On one hand, you have the norm, the norm of the government. You have the norm, the, the law of the state. On the other hand, you have an ethical stance. And this ethical stance, I was, I was in awe when I heard that, and I read that. In, and f, you know, it is actually starting from uh, in, in, when he was uh, the officer, commissioned officers, uh, in the example of Mustafa Kemal, and. Here, the decision taking is very important. We are all human beings, we are all leaders, and we have to take decisions. And what are the values that we act upon? What are the principles that we are going to act upon when we take those decisions? So if you allow me, I would like to finish my speech over here. And from the bottom of my heart, I would like to thank you so much for listening to me. And once again, as I have indicated, I would like to re revisit what I said at the beginning of my speech. May the 100th anniversary of our republic be a blessed one. Thank you.